Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Today we will discover the Glashjik, or Maijun Uenu, a being found in the folklore of the Scottish Highlands. A tutelary creature, cursed by the Fae, the Glashjik has the appearance of a woman dressed in green, with long white or yellowing hair, and a cry so unearthly that it has been likened to the wail of a banshee. Many a tale mentions that at one time the Glashjik was human, but she fell under the enchantments of the Fae, and her clothing is said to be green, a colour thought to be favoured by fairy women, and she became so pale and wan that those who saw her named her Glashjik. Her glass in Gaelic means to become grey, wan, and sallow. Her appearance varies from place to place. Sometimes she is a stout and sturdy creature, or an old wizened woman. Or as we find, in John Gregerson Campbell's Superstitions of the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, published in 1900, she was said to be very tall, lathe of body like a white reflection or shade. This book has been an invaluable resource of information, not just for myself, but for many others researching this area of folklore. The Glashjik has been called a crone, sometimes in connection with the Kaliach, and sometimes possessing traits associated with the Banshee. She is a being who watches over cattle on farmsteads, and even the protector of deer that roam freely in the woodland and glens of the highlands. There are accounts where the Glashjik has an altogether strange form, retaining the upper half of a woman's body and the lower half of a coat, a glimpse of her hooves occasionally appearing from beneath the hem of her dress. The old castle sleet on Skye is said to have a glashjik resembling a young woman with long hair who waits beside a gruga stone for her allowance of milk. On the island of Tyree, the glashjik is referred to as a sea gruga, that is, a sea maiden, brownie, or fairy. Gruga also means long haired one, and in Argyllshire, Campbell notes that it was used when describing a glashjik. In Rolls of the Northern Goddess, Dr Hilda Ellis Davidson notes, from hunting stories collected and translated by James McDougall in 1910 and Campbell in 1900, a supernatural woman, or glashjik, plays a role similar to that of the goddess of hunting in other cultures. In this role, the glashjik is the guardian of the deer, and in particular the hinds, whom she warns huntsmen against killing. However, Davidson also tells us that the glashjik might just as easily mark one of her herd with a hunter's dart. What I did find rather interesting was a detail in the stories regarding offerings, which we will come back to in a moment. But for now, Davidson explains that some of the tales regarding hunters seeking shelter in a time of need often comes at a cost, suggesting a tradition of hunters leaving part of their game as an offering to the guardian of the woods. The tales of men sheltering in bothies are somewhat darker. The glashjik appears in the form of an old crone, or as an overbearing presence or shadow. She strikes fear into the men, and in one particular story enchants the hunters with visions of their lovers, only to attack them and drain their bodies of blood. It is not hard to imagine a group of weary men telling tales by the fireside, stories passed down through the generations. And in Scotland's distant past, there were times when rival clans fought one another in bloody encounters spanning hundreds of years over titles, territory and wealth. Perhaps this too adds to the terror of an entity stalking the hillside, or provides an explanation for mysterious deaths. When we investigate the folklore of the Glashjik who are attached to farms, it appears once more to provide protection or something of a watchful eye over the herd. These stories tend to stress that the glashjik usually remains unseen, but on the rare occasions when they are visible to the human eye, they walk among the cattle, a faint image as if made of mist. 
John Gregerson Campbell makes an interesting observation about the attachment a Glastric makes to a place or group of people. He says, In olden times, there was a perpetuity of tenure enjoyed by large tenants, and it is not surprising that writers have often fallen into the mistake of supposing the tutelary guardian of the house to be that of its tenants. The Glastric had sympathy with the tenant so far, that she broke out into loud expressions of joy or sorrow, or made her appearance more frequently when happiness or misfortune were to come upon the family, but her real attachment was to the building or site. When the Glastric attaches itself to either a herd, tenant or land, offerings are made to thank her for protection, or work she carried out when all those free from enchantments have retired for the evening. Milk, meat, or sometimes fish, were placed on a stone where the Glastric was thought to dwell. In Peat and Flame, by Alistair Alpin McGregor, he provides an account of Crofters and Colonsey around 1910, placing milk in the cavity of a stone. This practice took place each year on the first evening on which the cattle were left out overnight. He writes, On such occasions, each crofter was obliged to give the whole of the night's milk from one cow. Once he poured this milk into the cavity, it became incumbent upon him to turn away immediately and not look back under any circumstances. The Glastrick appears to be fearful of dogs, which Campbell notes as being shared by fairy kind. But from time to time, she will assume the shape of a dog, and there is a story concerning the Glastrick of Arden or Drockett that I'll share with you now. In MacGregor's Peat and Flame, he tells us, Not far from Craig Near, on the Isle of Mull, is a place called Ard Nadrocket, where lived a family named Lament. Now these Laments were served by a Glastric, who assumed the form of a dog. One day, there came across the sound of Mull from Morfin, a band of cattle reavers, intent on lifting such beasts belonging to the Laments as their craft could hold. But the Glastric of Ard Nadrocket observed their landing, and immediately proceeded to drive the livestock back to the hills. At a spot still known as Hero's Hollow, where the reavers overtook the herd, the Glastrick struck each animal in turn, transforming it into a grey stone, so as to prevent it falling into the reaver's hands. These stones are to be seen in the Hero's Hollow to this day, and their number testifies to the magnitude of the herd then owned by the Laments. After this occurrence, the Glastrick pined away and died, Though the family showed her every kindness and consideration, and frequently sought to console her for the loss of her cattle. The Laments buried her with due reverence, down by the Sound of Mull, and in a patch of ground where in olden times it was customary to inter unbaptized children. Mischief, or the Glastic making her feelings understood, is not unusual, and we find this a common occurrence when it comes to hauntings. On the island of Col, in Briacha Castle, it is said the Glastic would often confuse weary house guests and misdirect them as they searched for their bedroom in the dead of night. At Inverell House near Loch Etib, the resident Glastic was thought to have been a former mistress of the property, but she had been unfaithful and was consequently buried alive. She made her presence known by moving furniture and causing general disruption. The Elle Maid of Dunstaffnage is said to have wailed before impending events, be they joyous or otherwise, and on one occasion so resented a guest overstaying his welcome that she kept him awake all night, pacing back and forth in the corridor and pulling the sheets from his bed. On the Isle of Tyree, where the Glastic is referred to as the Grugach Mara, or Sea Maid, and though rarely ever seen, she was said to resemble a little woman with yellow hair and said to haunt the locked attics of a house, where she can be heard working and putting the house in order before guests arrived. She was also known to have struck servants who neglected their work. It might be fair to say the Glastic is a fairly complex entity. She has the power to help or hinder, and though she is a ghost-like figure 
capable of moving around unseen. Her behaviour suggests there is thought and feeling in her actions. She forms attachments to people and places, and has even been described as having her own children. Though many tales relate the Glashtik as a lone and solitary figure, if she is accompanied, it is usually with her young, the Milchian. There are folk tales found in the Book of Arun with Michelin feature, and they are rather sombre and sad. In this quote from the book, it tells us, In Arun, a long time ago, was to be found a kind of curious creature called the Bleaters. They were neither man nor beast. They would come unbidden, whence no one knew, and when they would take their departure, it was unknown where they went. The story reveals that a family in the south end of the island was well acquainted with a being of this kind for some time. It was often seen with the cattle, or lying low in a cow's stall at the head of the byre. In the time the bleater was with the family, he was never seen eating, but every night, after the wife would smear the fire, which means it was smothered so that it was kept burning or smouldering until dawn, and this might have been done with damp potato peelings or damp oats, something similar. The wife would throw a handful of meal on the pot hanger, and when they arose in the morning, it was always licked clean. This was the way of things until the son of the house was married. There came a day when it was very bitter and the young wife of the son threw a coat over the milchen, trying to protect him from the bitter cold. But the poor creature took great offence and disappeared, and there was sorrow in the house for he was never seen again. I care not whatever, said the mother of the house, if he does not tell two things, what virtue is in the root of a burr, and what substance is in the sweat of an egg. The second story is an account of a milchen that watched over the cattle of three farms at Fianen. Nothing could be seen of the covered body but the legs, it was thought the creature was male, and every morning he was found in a particular hillock shouting to the farmers Cook, McKinnon and Ferguson to turn out their cattle. One cold winter's day, a woman found the creature standing on a flagstone. She took pity at its moaning and lamenting as it shivered in the perishing cold. Pulling her plaid from her shoulders, she wrapped it about the milchen, but as she did so the creature cried, Ill is the turn you have done me, and heavy is the burden you have laid upon me. As this was said, the creature disappeared and was not seen again. The last account gives us a little more information about the curious words of the good wife who said, What virtue is in the root of the burr, and what substance is in the sweat of an egg? One night, as the farmer made his way home on a lonely stretch of road, to clack egg from Lamlash, he was leapt upon and pushed from his horse, but managed to seize his attacker and bind him with a leather belt. When he finally made his way home, he found in his grasp a creature quite unlike anything he had seen before, but knew it to be the offspring that had their abode here and there among the recesses of the island. The farmer secured the creature only a short time, for its mother was searching for her son and with ferocity demanded the release of her child, saying, Wet and cold, my beard, put my darling outside, or the highest stone in the house will soon be the lowest. The farmer, wisely, released the creature, but the mother was heard saying to her offspring, I hope you have not revealed the virtue of egg water, or the root of the nettle. In some Scottish folklore, it is thought that washing one's face in the water an egg has been boiled or cleaned with welcomes bad fortune, and it is therefore unwise to do so. Nettle root was thought to treat inflammation, arthritis, gout, and chronic muscle pain, while the dried leaves were used for a nourishing, vitamin-rich tea. Nowadays, we can buy nettle root as a prepared supplement, but as with anything like this, it's important to do a little research and I've included a link to a website in today's show description. I always enjoy ending an episode with a piece of myth, legend or lore, 
and today I have an interesting legend to share with you. The music is provided by Kai Engel, and the song is Endless Story About Sun and Moon, from the album Idea, which is available on Bandcamp. John Gregerson Campbell shares a version of this legend, which I will read to you now. There was a man who went by the name of Kennedy, from McCurrick, who lived in Lineken in Loch Arbor. One night, as he was returning home from setting a salmon net in the river, a glashtick appeared by the bank of a stream. Unafraid, he wrapped his arms about her and took her with him to the house, and refused to free her unless she built for him a large barn. She did it in one night. As her parting gift, she both blessed and laid a curse upon the McCurricks, that they should grow like rushes, but weather like ferns. This proved to be the case, for as the family reached their full strength and growth, they wasted prematurely away. And so the legend goes something like this. One night, McCurick was going home from the smithy. The Glashtick met him as he was crossing Kerr at the ford of Crossick. He tied her before him, safely and surely, on the back of the mettlesome horse, with the wizard belt of felon. And he swore and asservated vehemently and stubbornly he would not let her go from his grasp till he showed her before men. Let me go, said she, and I will give loss and damage a full fold of speckled cattle, white-bellied, black, white-headed, success on hill and in company to yourself and your sort after you. That is mine in spite of you, said he, and it suffices not to set you free. Let me go, and I will leave your land, for in the knoll I stayed, and I will build thee tonight on yonder field a big, strong dyke house. A house fire will not pierce water nor arrow nor iron, and will keep thee dry and comfortable, without dread or fear, and charmed against poison, catherines, and fairies. Fulfill your words, said he, and from me get your leave. She gave a shriek with wailing that was heard over seven hills. It seemed as if the horn of Worth owned by Finn had whistled. Every fairy dwelling and beetling cliff wakened and echoed, and they gathered round the meadow, waiting for her orders. She set them to work speedily, calmly, orderly, and they brought flagstones from the shore of Clinic Waterfall, reaching them from hand to hand on the knoll of Shore Islet, where cut beams and rafters and supports long, straight and thick and brown wood, while she herself unceasing said, one stone above two stones, and two stones above one. Fetch stake, clod, thatching pen, every timber in the wood but Mulberry. Alas for him, who gets not as he sows, and sows not as he gets. And at the grey dawning there was a divot on the roof and smoke from it. He kept the coulter in the fire to keep him from mischance, since he knew the pranks and enchantments of fairies. When the house was now finished, and she had made up each loss, he listened to the maid and suffered no harm. Going past the window in front, she stretched him her crooked palm to bid him farewell, but truly, to take him to the sheen. The skin of her palm stuck to the coulter, and she sprang away on a grey stone of the field to pronounce his doom. The glashtick brought the curse of the people on him, and the curse of the goblins, and if we may believe as we hear, she obtained her request. Grow like rushes, weather like fern, turn grey in childhood, change in height of your strength. I ask not a son may succeed. I am the sorrowing glashtick that stayed in the land of the meadow. I built a house on the field which caused a sore pain in my side. I will put out my heart's blood, 
high on the peak of Feniskeek, which will be red forevermore. And she leapt in a green flame over the shoulder of the peak. I hope you have enjoyed some of the tales of the Glashjik. There is a part of me that can't help but sympathize for these women, enchanted or cursed, not quite human nor a fae, doomed to live unseen, but for rare glimpses here and there, her lamentable cries of anguish or joy ringing out like the wail of the Banshee, waiting, dwelling by stones where an offering might be left in thanks of her care of cattle or labors within the walls while all others sleep. Young, old, grey, green, wan and pale, or as translucent as mist. Her only companion, a youngling, as strange as she. Before we go today, I have some news to share, so please hold on just one more moment. I'm delighted to announce the return of Fjorn's Hall which launches on the 29th of September. If, like me, you've missed the hall, then this is surely cause for excitement. There is a wealth of new resources and materials awaiting. You will find a subscription-based educational website with courses, research pages, and resources covering Norse history, literature, and lore. Please log next Tuesday in your calendar. You don't want to miss this. You need search no farther than the hall for sources, courses, interactive maps, and much more. My good friends from beneath the Northern Lights have been incredibly busy too. If you have an interest in Sami culture and history, please check out their website and try their course on York. I have, and I loved every minute of it. A new intake starts in October, and the course is a really wonderful introduction to one of the oldest singing traditions that has been kept alive by talented and passionate people. And the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast will also be exploring the fascinating mythology and folklore of the Sami very soon. Johanna, Katrin Friedrich's daughter and I are hard at work writing and researching for our series on the women pioneers of the Vinland sagas. We have some wonderful content on its way to you soon. But in the meantime, we would love to hear any feedback that you might have or have a wee look at our website, where you will find episodes 1 and 2, plus a wealth of resources and fascinating information. I'll include links in the show description. And whatever you do, don't forget to check out Old Norse for Modern Times. There will be more updates on the way soon. As always, please feel free to get in touch over Twitter at LoreMyth, email mlegendlore at gmail.com, or on the Myth, Legend and Lore Facebook or Patreon page. And I must, as always, extend my heartfelt thanks to my wonderful Patreon family who make all of this possible. But above all else, and most importantly, take care for now. I'm Siobhan Clark, and this is the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>